As I mentioned on the table out by the front door, I see that some folks took some. I hope that you will take all those gospel tracts that you can prayerfully use. As I said, I hope that you'll take one and keep it yourself and try to maybe memorize some more Bible verses. In that booklet by Roger, it's a very motivational, inspirational book to get out there and win souls. <coughs> You've probably heard me mention it a number of years ago when I was still writing sword articles. I wrote an article about one of our missionaries, Daryl Brown. And years ago, before he started working with AGM, he said he got to thinking about it one day and he said he knew he was going to be ashamed when he stood before the Lord Jesus Christ to give account of his life and he had no fruit, nothing. He had never won a soul to Christ, never witnessed anybody and he said, I knew I was going to be ashamed. And it took him some time but he started winning some souls and it got so good at it. Uh, his wife died a few years ago, and I'm not sure if he's still alive or not. He's several years older than I am. And he won more than 16,000 souls to the Lord. 16,000. And he was very bashful, and I've worked with him and watched him, and just very soft-spoken, but he's very sincere about what he does, and people get saved. Proverbs chapter 3 Verse 5 and 6, you probably guessed that that's where I was going to. I guess two of the most famous verses in the book of Proverbs, and I would imagine a number of people in here have memorized those verses many years ago. But I want to talk to you tonight about dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> trusting Him. We trust Him in many areas, but can we completely trust Him? Let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll speak to hearts tonight. Help me to speak plainly and clearly to say exactly what you would have me to say tonight. That we might speak to hearts and change lives. Bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can say it by memory and not look at your Bible, just go ahead and do that. Trust in the Lord. With all thine heart. Now there are two alls in this passage. Verse 5 has an all. Verse 6 has an all. Those two alls. We sang a hymn this morning. Have you all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Have you all on the altar of sacrifice laid? That's probably a pretty hard question to answer for most of us. We think, well gee, you know, I've laid a lot on the altar. But all... I'm not certain I've laid all on the altar. But it says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. I'm not sure I can say I've done that. You know, we trust the Lord with our salvation, but when we say we've trust the Lord with all of our heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now what I want to think about tonight is the Lord's will for our life, directing our paths. Now I don't care what age you are. I know I'm one of the older ones in here. But I still want God's guidance and direction in my life. As a matter of fact, some of the things that's going on in my life right now, the situation with my wife's health, you know, I'm getting advice from a lot of people. <laughs> My brother, my sister, my daughter, with well, dad, Fred, here's what you need to do. You know, they know that Ann's situation is bad, deteriorating. In fact, my brother told me, he said, well, Fred, it's going to reach a point where you're not going to be able to take care of her. Here's what you need to do. Well, I'm trusting the Lord in this matter. I'm waiting for the Lord to show me exactly what he would have us to do. Trust is a thing that has been said that you can't demand trust from people. You have to earn people's trust. How many politicians in Washington right now do you trust? How many news commentators do you trust? You know that they're telling you the truth. <laughs> I tell you, I have no problem saying that there's very few of that crowd in leadership positions in Washington that I trust. Do I trust Donald Trump? 
Not really. I'm a Republican. I believe in voting Republican because they stand closer to the Lord and biblical principles than the Democrats do. That's the reason I'm a Republican. Not because of Donald Trump or somebody else that's been in leadership. But trust, you know, it comes down to an everyday thing. Do you trust the mechanic that you take your car to? You got a plumber you can trust or an electrician, a carpenter, somebody like that? Do you trust? What about a doctor? Well, my wife has seen a ton of doctors here lately. You know, I go to the VA hospital for my medical needs, and there are some down there that I trust and some I'm not so sure of. But my wife has said a time or two, well, I, I just don't trust that doctor. There's a dentist that I went to that I've been going down to down here in, uh, in Newberry. For several years, I've gone down there, went to that fella, and, and most everything he did for me, the bill came out to about $200. Well, I went to him, it's probably been a couple of years ago now, at least a year, and I went to him, he did a very simple procedure on me, it took him about 30, 35 minutes, didn't use any deadening, nothing like that, just a very simple little procedure. And charged me $600. Thinking back on it now, if I'd have thought about it then, I'd have said, you get that bill down to $300 or I'll see you in court, buddy. I wrote him a letter and told him, I said, you're a crook. What makes a doctor or a dentist think they can charge anything that they want to and you don't have any say about it? If you had a flat tire and you went into a station and had it fixed, Took the guy half an hour and said, okay, that'll be $1,000. <laughs> Would you pay him? <laughs> You'd be crazy if you did. Well, who do you trust? I don't trust that dentist anymore. I'll never go back to him. I told him in that letter I wrote to him, I said, you're a crook and you'll never see me again. Who do you trust? Ourselves. People that you know, that know you, I'm talking about really know you, do they trust you? And you know you can spend a lifetime building a life of trust and people that will put their confidence in you and you can tear it all down in one day, one episode, one minute, something of that nature. It doesn't take long. Some people, some of the politicians that have been caught in a lie in recent years, you know, they've had a career going for them. They were in some kind of office and they were caught in something. You can't trust them anymore. What about in a marriage? How would you like to be in a marriage where you couldn't trust your wife or your wife couldn't trust your husband? And yet I'm sure that there's plenty of them like that. When you look at the Hollywood type marriages, that crowd out there, <laughs> And they've been in and out of marriages. How in the world could a husband or wife trust the other one? I'd hate to be in a marriage like that. Trust is a very important thing. But it says we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart. With all of our heart. Do we do that today? Everybody said, well, yeah, I, I, I trust him with my salvation. He saved my soul. But you know, one of the last things that people learn to trust the Lord with is their pocketbook. They understand, they know what the Bible says about tithing. They've heard a lot of teaching and preaching on tithing. Well, Lord, you take care of everything else in my life. I want you to keep me well and healthy, but I'll watch out for the pocketbook, okay? You know, when I was pastoring at Hilton Head Island, and I've given you some of my testimony concerning tithing, for a long time I was a number one giver in our church, giving more than a double tithe every week. <clears throat> but the Lord took care of us at that church financially in an unbelievable way. When we got ready to build our building, I went to a bank and I secured a loan. I told him, I said, I said, just in case the Lord doesn't come through and we're in a pinch and we need some money to do something on this building project, I said, I want to have a loan in place. I took him a sheet, what I called a spreadsheet, of the dollar amount of all the people in our church and how much they gave. There were no names attached to it and I showed it to him. I said, this is the giving amounts of all the people in our church. And he was very impressed. He looked at it and said, wow, how much do you need? And I got that loan in place, 
But the Lord took care of us so miraculously so many times. We built that entire structure and everything without borrowing a dime. The money just poured in. It was amazing. One time several things had happened there. Had a new neighbor bought the house next door to us and he was out walking his dog one day on a Saturday morning. He's a doctor, an eye doctor, lives up in West Virginia. And he was out there, went out and introduced myself, told him who I was and invited him to come to our church. <laughs> Lo and behold, the next day he and his wife came to our church. <laughs> and I told him a little about what we were doing. He started giving us thousands of dollars. At the end, he said, y'all need a grand piano. He said, I'm going to give you $7,000. I want you to buy a grand piano and put it in here. We did. We bought that grand piano with the money that he gave us. Good friend of mine, maybe you've heard of the Stokes Automobiles. They're related to the ones that's in Newberry, but he's over in Buford. A wealthy man. And he had told me one time, well, there's two people there involved here. But Jerry Stokes gave us a big offering up in the tens of thousands of dollars as we were going along building. And then another man that we had met that started coming to our church, he owned automobile dealerships also, but up in Greenville. He's out of that business now, but he told me, he said, Fred, he said, I'm going to help you. He said, one of these days when you got a need, he said, you let me know and I'm going to help you. The last bill that we owed was the paving of the parking lot. Everything was paid for in the building, but the bill to build the parking lot was going to be $52,000. We didn't have the money. We were down to the last two or $3,000 in our bank account, and I told him, and I called his name and I said, I remember that you said you'd be willing to help us out. He said, how much you need? I said, well, the bill is $52,000. And I said, all we've got is two or 3,000 on that. He said, I'm gonna give you $26,000, half of it. He's got his own jet plane. He flew down to Hilton Head that day and wrote me a check for $26,000. I called the paving contractor and I said, look, I said, I'm short about $22,000 or $23,000. I said, will you give us a few months to pay you the rest of it? And he said, yes, I will. Just that quick. He said, yeah, I'll do that. The money just kept coming in. We paid it off. I mean, we paid that uh, paving contractor off just in a month or two. The money just poured in. And I can say that in my own life, that I learned to trust God with money. I started tithing back when I was a kid, been tithing all of my life long. I've learned that you can trust God not only with your salvation, but with your pocketbook and everything in your life. You don't have to wonder about it. He's going to do it. But too many people think, well, you know, I'm just too poor. I can't do that. I talked to somebody one time. He was a pastor, a young pastor, new in the ministry. He said, well, I just can't afford to tithe. I said, you can't afford not to tithe. I said, here you are. You're going to be preaching and teaching about a God that we need to put our faith and trust in. And you don't trust him. Not completely you don't. You don't trust him with your pocketbook. Well, I'm not sure whether he started tithing or not. But trust the Lord with all thine heart and lay not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Do you do that in your life? Do you acknowledge him every opportunity that you get? Acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. Those tracks are out on the table. A number of people took them. I passed out a number of tracks this week, today. We can acknowledge the Lord everywhere we go in our life by letting people see Jesus Christ in us. I want you to turn back to that psalm now, Psalm 37. Psalm 37 is a contrast between wickedness and righteousness. The whole chapter, that's what it's about. The wicked versus, versus the righteous. Now, in the first few verses up to verse 7, there are five things here, five things. Now skim with me a little bit, okay? Number one, trust in the Lord. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Trust in the Lord. Verse 4, number 2, delight thyself also in the Lord. 
Number three in verse five, commit thy way unto the Lord. Number four in verse seven, rest in the Lord. Number five also in verse seven, wait patiently for the Lord. Now let's go back up to verse one again. Trust in the Lord and do good. Do good. Look at verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways. A good man. Romans 3.12 says there's none that doeth good. No, not one. I use that verse a lot when dealing with people in the fairs or wherever, talking about sin. And they say, well, you know, I'm a good person. I deserve to go to heaven. I'm, I'm as good as anybody else. And I look at them, the Bible says there's none that doeth good. No, not one. And this says right here, it says the steps of a good man. Verse 3, do good. Romans chapter 3 is talking about salvation. This chapter is talking about sanctification. As a matter of fact, the front, I guess it's that sword of the Lord out there. It's talking about the good man Noah. Noah was a good man. Now, if one of your friends that knew you quite well indeed, you walked up to him and say, is he a good man? <laughs> he's not talking about your salvation. He's talking about how you present yourself to the world. Do people trust you? Is he trustworthy? Can I take his word to the bank? You know what he says? Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Verse 4 again. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. You know, I thought about that verse a thousand times. And he will give thee the desires of thine heart. Well, in all honesty, I've got some desires that have not been fulfilled. And I think about it, I say, now Lord, here's what your word says. <laughs> well, do I delight myself in the Lord? What does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? You ever see a mama with a new baby? <laughs> she and that father delight themselves in that child. Can't get enough of that child. Man, just want to be around that child. And I remember when our kids were small, what it was like, how I delighted myself and our children, our son first, and then our daughter. And I guess particularly our daughter, because she was a daughter, a girl, and a good-looking one at that. And she grew hair down to the middle of her back. I mean, that long blonde hair, by the time she was three or four years old, her hair was just all the way down her back. And I used to delight in going out in public and sometimes we'd let her walk out like we're in a mall and let her walk out in front of her and we'd look at people's reaction. People turn around and it was just as curly as it could be. I said, look at that little girl there, you know. Well, that was our delight. She was our delight. Do you delight in the Lord like that? Jesus Christ is my Savior. It astonishes me how many people cannot say the name Jesus. I talked to them about salvation. I said, well, do you know you're going to heaven? Yeah, well, how is it you know? Because I've asked him to save me. And I look at them and I say, him who? Well, God. Which God are you talking about? The one up there. Well, what's his name? They just, I'll ask them three or four questions. They can't say the name Jesus. Do you delight in saying the name Jesus to others? Jesus is my Savior. Hallelujah. People times, sometimes, this has happened several times, be out in public somewhere, and uh, I, I walked into a doctor's office up here in Newberry, the eye doctor, and walked in the office, and, uh, and she was doing something at a minute, and uh, she turned around, she looked at me, and she said, sir, can I help you? Well, my wife was already in there. And I said, no, I'm just waiting on the Lord. And she said, oh, me too. <laughs> kind of like that, and I thought, well, okay, good, good. But just people are embarrassed to say things like that. We were on a cruise some years ago. And those elevators that run up and down in the middle of the ship, if you've been on them. And, uh, you know, sometimes those elevators will be packed out around mealtime. It's hard to get on an elevator. And one time one stopped at our floor. And I don't know where my wife was, but I was there, there by myself waiting on the elevator. And uh, 
The door came open and it was packed full of people, but there was one guy standing in there and said, where are you going? And I said, to heaven. You know what he said? To hell you are. And I said, well, that sounds like where you're going. No, I'm going to heaven. And everybody on that elevator heard it, which I'm glad. Delight thyself in the Lord. Do you? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Look at verse 5. Commit thy way into the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Commit thy way unto the Lord. So many people are unwilling to make a commitment. When you think about marriages, there's one person in my family, and I think the problem was she was unwilling to commit herself to a marriage. So many people this day and time said, well, we'll get, we'll get married. If it don't work out, we'll just get divorced and try something else. No, when I married my wife, I committed myself to it right then. I said, I don't want to hear the word divorce in our family. We're not going to think about that. I'm committed to this to the day I die. And I was still committed to it like that. And when we do something, you know, you sign a contract, you're committing yourself to something and you ought to abide by your word and what you're doing. Commit yourself. Commit yourself to the Lord. When I knew that the Lord had called me to preach and I was in Atlanta and some of you know my testimony. I was there. I was trying to get on with Delta Airlines, planning on spending the rest of my life flying airplanes and started going to Curtis Hudson's church and I knew the Lord was calling me to preach and I went to him one day and told him about that. Well, my wife at that time was against it. She didn't want to be a preacher's wife. You know, I guess thinking the pressure on her that she couldn't live up to it. She couldn't be a preacher's wife and good standing or whatever. I don't know. Of course, she came to where she submitted to it and was fine with it. But I quit my job. I mean, I committed. When I went to Bible college... I didn't say, well, I'm going to try this. I'll go to Bible college and work on the side and see what I can do here. No, I committed myself to it. When we went to Hilton Head Island to start the church over there, we, all, we started as a Bible study in a friend's home, a friend that lived over there. And we started as a Bible study, and I told him, I said, Dave, on the very first night of this Bible study, I'm going to announce to everybody that we're going to start a church out of this Bible study. Well, there was about 15, maybe 20 people there that first night. Well, after we got the church going a little bit, and we started looking for a house, I mean, we started looking for a house pretty soon after we got over there. And one of the men in the church told me, he said, well, why don't you rent a house to begin with instead of buying one? You know, saying if this doesn't work out, you're not going to be tied down. I told him, I said, no, I came over here to start a church. I'm committed to it. And I'm going to stay here and I'm going to do it. And that's what I did. We bought a house and still just had a few people at that time, but I was committed to it. And that's what we need to do. We need to, need to make up our minds. Hey, I'm going to put down some, some, some roots here and you're just going to stay here and going to get committed to it. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Commit thy way unto the Lord. These people that I heard a preacher on television the last day or two, he was talking about people, or was it the preacher this morning was talking about people that say, well, I used to be a Christian. I've heard that a hundred times, if not a thousand times. Well, I used to be a Christian. I used to go to church. I've had people tell me, I used to do what you're doing out soul winning. I used to do that. They're not committed to it. I started winning souls before I ever committed to being a pastor. I was a layman in the church like anybody in here. But I went to Curtis Hudson's church here at Forest Hills and I'd never been to a church where they had soul winning programs. They talked about going out and winning souls to Christ. I said, well, I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm going to learn how to win souls. I still remember the first soul that I ever won. Nervous as could be. But I committed to it. I said, I'm going to do this. Maybe that's the reason the Lord called me to preach because I made up my mind. I'm going to learn how to win souls to Jesus Christ. I'm committed to it. Still am today. Pass out gospel tracts, witness to people every week. I'd like to say every day, but I don't leave my house every day. With the situation that we're under, a lot of times don't go anywhere. 
But every time I go out, I've got gospel tracts in my pocket looking for somebody to witness to. I'm committed to it. We need to be committed to it. Commit thy way into the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Let's go ahead and read verse 6. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Rest in the Lord. How do you do that? How do you do that? Rest in the Lord. You know, we can get so burdened in this life down here, so busy, get such a heavy schedule, things bearing down on us, that sometimes it's just, whew, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And we need rest. We need bodily rest. Something that I do from time to time, I did it last night. No, it was two nights ago, I guess it was. I've got a boat slip in my backyard and pull my boat up in that boat slip. I've been catching a lot of fish lately. But sometimes I'll go down there and I'll sit in the back seat of that boat. And I'm facing out towards the water away from the house. And two nights ago when all those heavy clouds were coming up, and I'm just sitting there and watching that weather and those clouds. But sometimes doing that, it just brings rest unto my soul. Just to sit out there amongst the nature. As a matter of fact, I've read stories about that, that that's one of the best things that you can do to calm yourself down, is to get out and take a walk in the woods. Trust in the Lord. Rest in Him. We get so weary sometimes from doing... <laughs> At my age now, I go out and I work in the yard about 15 minutes and I have to rest about 30 before I start working again. Uh, but to be able to rest in the Lord, and, and you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to do that. To come to church. Not a big crowd here tonight. But we can come to church. We can sing together. Rest in the Lord, listen to the preaching of his word, and find rest for our souls. That's what we need to do, is find rest for our souls. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm waiting patiently for the return of the Lord. And sometimes it's not too patiently. I guess patience has never been one of my long suits. As a matter of fact, we were talking about fishing the other day. One of my buddies lives down the street from me. He's a big cat fisherman. He and I were out yesterday morning together. It's kind of amazing to me on Saturday morning we were out there, and usually there's just tons of boats out there running around, but there's nobody out there. Just he and I. He, he was in his boat and I was in mine. But we stayed pretty close together. We were talking about crappie fishing one time, and I told him, I said, I just don't think I have the patience to be a crappie fisherman. <laughs> I like to bash fish, a lot of action, throwing that lure out there all the time and going after them. But whereas crappie fishing, it's a little slower. You sit there and put your bait down. You sit there and wait for somebody to come up and pull that bobber under or whatever. Patience is not my long suit. But it says, wait patiently. Wait patiently for the Lord. Well, I'm waiting for him to come and take me home. Don't know when it's going to be, but I'm looking forward to it. Now, if you want to turn there, you can. Psalm 119, I'm going to go there if you want to just listen to this part. But Psalm 119, verse 105, says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Look at verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One of these days, the sun, the moon, the stars are all going to be done away with. Jesus is going to be the light of the world. He is the light. But this thing about light... A lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. 
God's word will show you where he wants you to go, what he wants you to do. Just like I mentioned about the advice that my brother and sister and daughter's given to me. Well, I'm waiting for God to speak to my heart and show me exactly what my path is to be, where I should go and what I should do. In reading the Bible, I read a book one time by a pastor, and he was talking about your own personal devotions, reading your Bible. And he said this, and I've never, it's the only thing I really remember from that book. He said, in reading your Bible, he said, it's early, first, or nothing. I don't fully agree with him because I'd rather somebody read their Bible at night than not read it at all. But what he's saying is you need the Word of God guiding your feet through that day, every day. We need to be reading God's Word and standing on it and trusting Him. This thing about light, you know, boy, if you've ever been out in the woods on a dark night, I can remember one night when I was in ROTC summer camp back in the 60s. And we were out on what's called a night compass course, all the different training that they give us. This was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And we had groups of four and five that would go out and we would rotate the leadership positions. And this night on the night compass course, it was my turn to be in charge of our group of men. The, I don't remember four or five, maybe six at the most of us. It was so black that night. It was pouring down rain. I don't mean drizzling. It was pouring down rain. Lightning was flashing across the sky. But these military compasses, what you do is you take a flashlight and you stick it right on the top of it. How many of you know that routine? <laughs> Ever seen it? And what it does, it charges that compass up. It's a glowing compass, and when you put that flashlight on the top of it and leave it there for a few minutes, then that compass will glow. It was so black that night, and with the rain coming down also, once in a while, about every 15, 30 seconds, a flash of lightning would go across the sky and light everything up, and you could see a tree or something. But other than that, I can remember I kept that compass just like this trying to read that thing and get our group of men through those woods to a designated area where we were supposed to assemble. But when you've got a light, that little light on that compass where I could see that needle pointing in the direction that we're going to go, but it's astonishing how much that little light shows up when you're in a dark place. And I'm sure everybody here has seen that. You know what we're talking about. You go into a dark room if it's pitch black in here and you strike a match and all of a sudden you can see. I read the story, a true story. I wrote this up in the sword. <laughs> about a father and his two sons. Is it splunking? Is that what you call it when you go into a cave? I think that's what they call it is splunking. And they each had one of these miners' lights on their head. The father and both of the sons. And he said, we hadn't gone very far back into that cave. And he said, one by one, he said, all three of our lights went out. And he said, you talk about pitch black darkness. said, you couldn't see anything. Can't see your hand right there. We've probably all seen that where you put your hand up there and you can't see a thing. And he said the darkness is so dark, he said it starts to work on your mind. He said you can really start losing your mind. He said you can't tell which way is up. He said you start losing your balance. He said we'd have to sit down and stay together and hope that somebody would come in the cave and find us. No light whatsoever. And of course they did eventually. I forget how long it was, but somebody came in there and found them. But when you get in a situation like that where there's no light, and I wonder about hell. You know, I've thought about hell so many times and wondered, Lord, is so-and-so suffering in hell one of my best friend in high school? I witnessed to him extensively. And to my knowledge, he never got saved. And I sometimes think, Lord, is Mickey... Suffering in hell right now. Is he really down there? In the blackness of darkness forever. I suppose he is. I don't know. 
people that joke about hell and say, well, all my buddies going to be down there. Boy, we'll have a big time. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You're going to be all alone in the pitch blackness of darkness forever. Light. Jesus is the light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I try to read my Bible at least twice a day, morning, noon, and or night. I spend more time in the morning, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. You say, well, preacher, you're a preacher. That's what you ought to be doing. Yeah, but you ought to be doing it too. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Well, how are you going to do that if you don't know his word? His word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. The entrance of thy words giveth light. How are we going to get that? Why are we going to get that light and what God is trying to do for us if we don't read his word? We need to meditate on it, read it. That's the reason I mentioned those, <coughs> those little booklets out there. That one right there. Well, help from above. A lot of Bible verses in here, critical verses in those areas that I mentioned this morning. I'm proud that our pastor memorizes a lot of scripture. I talked to him about that several years ago. I said, Henry, I said, that's a good thing for you to do. I said, it makes a sermon more powerful, the more scripture that you can put in there and you memorizing it. And he does that. I've never been a good memorizer. I memorized a number of verses, but I wish I could had worked at it and memorized more. I know one pastor, my goodness, he can get up and just recite chapter after chapter after chapter. I think he died here a while back. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And I'm going to share something else with you here for a minute. This is one of my older Bibles that I used as my preaching Bible for a while, and it started coming apart, and I got another one. This is by S.M. Lockridge. If you know that name, he's one of the preachers from way back yesteryear. And if I'm not mistaken, that S.M. stands for Shadrach Meshach. That, that was really his name, Shadrach Meshach Lockridge, but they called him S.M. And he wrote this. And it's about trust in the Lord. I put this in this Bible probably 30 years ago. But listen to it. He's the one that made us. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. No means or measure can define his limitless love. And no far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. I'm telling you today, you can trust God. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He is enduringly strong and entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast and is immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful and is impartially merciful. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's the center savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. I'm trying to tell you, you can trust God. He does not have to call for help and you can't confuse him. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He stands alone in the solitude of himself. He's august. He's unique. He's unparalleled, he's unprecedented, he's supreme, he's preeminent, he's the loftiest idea in literature, he's the highest personality in philosophy, he's the supreme problem of higher criticism, he's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of the spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the age. He is the superlative of everything good that you can call him. I'm trying to tell you people, you can trust him. He can satisfy all your needs and he can do it simultaneously. He supplies strength of the weak and he is available for the tempted and the tried. 
He sympathizes and he sees. He guards, he guides, he heals the sick, he cleanses the lepers, he forgives sinners, he discharges debtors, he delivers the captives, he defends the feeble, he blesses the young, he regards the ages, aged, he rewards the diligent, he beautifies the meek. I'm telling you people, you can trust God. He is the key to knowledge. He is the wellspring of wisdom. He is the doorway of deliverance. He is pathway of peace. He is a roadway of righteousness. He is a highway of holiness. He is the gateway to glory. You can trust him. He is the master of the mighty. He is the captain of the conquered. He is the head of heroes. He is the leader of legislatures. <laughs> Well, we sure need him in Washington, I'll tell you that. He's the overseer of the overcomers, the governor of governors, prince of princes. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. People, you can trust him. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient, his reign is righteous, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I wish I could really describe him to you. He's indescribable because he's incomprehensible. He's irresistible because he is invincible. You can't get him off your hands, you can't get him off your mind, you can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Without a doubt, you can trust him. Pilate couldn't stand it when he found out he couldn't stop him, and Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. When the witnesses couldn't get their testimony to agree, and Herod couldn't kill him, and death couldn't handle him, and thank God the grave couldn't hold him, there was nobody before him, and there be no one after him. He has no predecessor. He's, he'll have no successor. You can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. Praise the Lord for that. You can trust him. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's all things. He's the giver of life. He's the joy out of every sorrow. He's the light out of every darkness. He's the peace that passes all understanding. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift. You can trust him. There is no God before him. There will be none after him. He is the first and the last. There is no other God. Thank you, Lord, for being trustworthy. We can trust him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. All, A-L-L, -L, all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I'm sure that's what everybody wants, is for God to guide and direct our paths so we don't crash and burn. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is trustworthy in every area that we can think of. Lord, if we didn't have a trustworthy Savior, where would we be? Yes, he is everything. And Father, he is the light to guide us, our path through this light, life. I don't care what age we are, how old we are, how young we are, we need guidance. And Father, for teenagers this day and time, most of them think they've got it all together. They know what they're doing. I'll handle this on my own. I don't need God to guide me. Well, I want to warn you, potholes are ahead of your life. We can crash and burn, and it doesn't take but one day, one wrong instance. Father, thank you for our time together. While our heads are bowed, Maybe there's somebody that needs to make a decision in here tonight. We're not going to have any music tonight. Not going to have any formal invitation. But maybe there's some commitment that you need to make to the Lord. Maybe you're not fully trusting him. What about your pocketbook? Do you trust him with that? What about reading the word of God? Early, first, nothing. Well, like I said, late in the day is better than nothing. But we need guidance all day long, every day of our lives. Thank you for these that have come, Father, and help us to be trustworthy. <coughs>
to make commitments that will stand by. Not just say, well, we'll try it for a little bit and see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. So bless us as we go now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight.